I would like to uh, have a video where I compare the digestive systems of uh, vertebrates, uh, which is both a continuation of the previous video, uh, beginning with the layers of the GI tract and the oral cavity, um, and then a supplement to the description of the human digestive uh, anatomy. Uh, and so as we, with you know, some understanding of the human structures, uh, then consider what we see in fish. Uh, what we see in this lamprey certainly seems odd in that we see an intestine and that's it. We don't really see a stomach and there's no division of uh, the uh, small and large uh, intestine. Uh, the earlier uh, jawless uh, fish um, did not eat large prey without jaws. And so therefore the stomach, uh, you know, a structure which holds, you know, larger items was not needed. Once again, as we can see in this uh, lamprey. Um, there are a few jawless fish in the fossil record, uh, which do seem to have some um, more prominent uh, swelling in the abdominal area. And so these jawless fish uh, known as thelodonts may provide evidence that uh, the stomach actually evolved uh, before jaws. Uh, but since these uh, are a little bit later. Jawed fish has already existed by the time that this group appears in the fossil record. Um, that may not uh, be uh, relevant to the ancestry of those jawed uh, vertebrates. Um, so when we look then at uh, the uh, shark, uh, we'll notice, you know, big differences uh, from uh, the other uh, fish. Uh, the liver is now a much larger structure. I'll talk about the liver uh, presently. Uh, and it's present in lobes, which is different from the condition of the jawless fish. And the stomach is, once again, a new organ, which the first vertebrates did not have. Uh, the stomach is uh, typically uh, J-shaped, doesn't have to be, um, but uh, is often a J-shaped, not only in um, the higher vertebrates, but through many fish uh, as well. And uh, the uh, stomach uh, then narrows to form a pylorus region, which just then joins the intestine. Uh, the spleen, as mentioned in the lymphatic system, is a single structure, which typically is associated with the uh, stomach on the left side of the body. Uh, the stomach is expansive so that an animal can ingest large prey and then gradually break it uh, down in the gastrovascular cavity. And thus there are these folds known as rugae, which allow the stomach to uh, expand. Um, so here you can see the, um, uh, the stomachs of other uh, fish, such as the gar and uh, the uh, bofin. From here, it leads into the uh, intestine, and uh, the intestine in fish is a single uh, structure, not divided into uh, small and large uh, uh, intestines. Notice that it is attached uh, by a uh, mesentery, uh, which helps uh, to uh, secure it. Uh, and so these are the organs uh, which we see in the gastrointestinal track of uh, fish. Um, fish, amphibians, and reptiles do not have an anus which is separate from the urethra and separate from, in females, the vagina. Instead, uh, there is a common opening known as a cloaca, which not only then uh, receives uh, the um, a terminus of the intestines and the gastrointestinal tract, but also then the urogenital tract as well. So the cloaca has um, is a common opening for the urinary reproductive and uh, digestive uh, systems. Uh, now uh, this opening for the cloaca and thus uh, you know the anus uh, being um, emptying into uh, that uh, cloaca. Notice that that does not occur at the tip of the body. Uh, at the tip of the tail, instead uh, midway along uh, the abdomen. And one of the defining features of the chordates is a post-anal tail. Uh, and so even before there were vertebrates and fish, uh, chordates had a muscular uh, tail, which was useful in uh, propulsion. So this is, what, uh, here is uh, the lancelet amphioxus. And notice it has elements beyond um, the end of the digestive system unlike most uh, invertebrates. Uh, 
And so that was the GI tract in uh, fish. Um, but I'd just like to just comment on some of the uh, other accessory structures which uh, they have as well. The first vertebrates did not have a pancreas, um, or at least not as a separate organ. So if we look at jawless fish alive today, the, um, there are masses of cells uh, which release uh, the enzymes uh, uh, released by the pancreas, but they are in diffuse masses along the intestines. Uh, the pancreas is not a solid uh, structure. Uh, it is so in the jawed vertebrate. So here in the shark, as you know, you follow the curve of the stomach, there is the spleen. You can also find then the pancreas, um, which uh, secretes uh, digestive uh, enzymes uh, into the um, uh, into uh, the uh, intestine. Uh, it has uh, separate uh, lobes. Uh, with a connecting uh, isthmus. And as we look at the pancreas and higher animals as well, it tends to be thin uh, following the uh, intestine as you can see uh, here. Now notice that this uh, shark has been triple injected so that the arteries are red, the veins are blue, but notice that you can see uh, here, the veins coming out of the digestive organs are yellow. Uh, that is because this is part of the hepatic portal system going to the liver. This liver and this hepatic portal system is actually ancient. Even going back to chordates, there is the homologue of the liver. And there is a hepatic portal system where the veins of uh, the intestine go to this uh, liver homologue before uh, they enter a circulation. We could call these chordate homologues hepatic sacculations. They are a little unlike the livers of vertebrates in that some digestion does actually occur uh, there. That uh, stopped uh, in uh, the early uh, jawless fish, but livers are quite ancient. Uh, here you see in a hagfish, uh, the liver is you know, a large a structure. In humans, it is the second largest organ after the skin. There you can see the liver of the uh, lamprey. And um, by the time uh, of the jawed vertebrates, the liver is larger and can be divided into lobes, as you see here in this uh, shark. Sharks are unique in that uh, their liver uh, has a, um, a fat in it, uh, which helps create buoyancy. So one of the reasons uh, for the large liver in uh, sharks is because it helps create you know, uh, buoyancy uh, since sharks, unlike the uh, bony fish, lack um, uh, swim bladders uh, where gases can provide this uh, buoyancy. The liver has a number of functions of which it, it makes bile. And so here in sharks, you can see that there is a gallbladder as well, which can collect and concentrate this bile that you can see here uh, in green. Um, uh, the green is in uh, large part because of the bilirubin pigment, which is derived from the breakdown of the bilirubin coming from red blood cells. Um, and so uh, these accessory uh, structures uh, of the jawed vertebrates are far more similar to each other than they were uh, of uh, the jawless uh, fish. And if you were to go uh, further into the bony fish, you can see a prominent uh, uh, liver uh, here. And uh, once again, you can see the gallbladder uh, and uh, the uh, bile ducts. Uh, the um, common bile duct brings a bile both from the liver and its hepatic duct and from the gallbladder and its cystic duct into the intestine. So here a green tube, a common bile duct uh, in, um, uh, in uh, these uh, jawed vertebrates uh, brings a bile uh, to uh, the intestines. Uh, there's the gallbladder where it can be concentrated there. And we can see this in other uh, fish as well. Now, that hepatic portal system, which is so important in humans, uh, we see uh, going back in fish as, uh, as well. So how does blood flow through the digestive system? Well, just as in humans, uh, instead of there being left and right arteries leaving from the dorsal aorta, there are unpaired arteries. There is a celiac trunk in sharks, an unpaired artery. There is a mesenteric artery, 
unpaired, just as in humans. So in humans, the major uh, arterial blood going to the digestive tract leave the aorta uh, in a celiac trunk and um, a superior mesenteric artery. And then we see the same is uh, true here. Uh, this brings oxygenated blood uh, to the digestive tract and the celiac trunk divides to make a hepatic artery, a gastric um, artery and a pancreatic, uh, pancreatico-mesenteric artery. In humans, the celiac trunk also divides into three, a hepatic artery, a gastric artery, and a splenic uh, artery. Um, uh, so uh, from this arterial blood, there are uh, capillaries, uh, and in then the organs, uh, food is uh, absorbed after being digested. So we have all of these veins uh, given uh, here, but the veins do not go into the cardinal veins, which would return them to the heart. Instead, the veins empty into a hepatic portal vein. Um, that's uh, what you had seen in yellow in the previous images. Um, so uh, just as um, the veins uh, with remains of the digested food uh, in humans have entered the hepatic portal vein and then go uh, to uh, the liver. The same is true here. It's called a portal vein uh, because there are capillaries uh, not only in the digestive, um, uh, in the uh, uh, digestive system, uh, but then also in uh, the liver as, uh, as well. So here's the bile duct, here is the uh, uh, hepatic portal uh, vein. There's some variation in the injection of these uh, separate um, uh, in uh, these uh, uh, separate uh, shark uh, specimens. Um, but once again, uh, you can uh, see that uh, there is a separate system of uh, circulation so that the uh, blue dye, which was in, injected into the veins, didn't reach these because uh, they have capillaries on either side of them. And so this was a triple injected uh, shark so that the hepatic portal vein, a portal vein having capillaries on either side, uh, then took up a different color dye, uh, the uh, yellow. Um, and so the basics of you know, the organs of the digestive system, then go back to early uh, vertebrates. And there's, you know, similarities, you know, even comparing uh, humans to uh, sharks. Um, if we were to look then at frogs, obviously there is a bit of a difference in that tadpoles are largely herbivores living on algae, um, uh, whereas uh, the adult frogs are carnivores. And so part of the metamorphosis of the frog is to digest its, uh, or to change its large um, uh, portion of intestine because uh, it does not need as much intestinal space to digest you know, the animal material of its adult diet. Um, these uh, frogs do not have a separate oral and nasal cavity. The internal nares empty into one uh, common uh, space. And uh, as uh, you uh, stretch out the um, uh, digestive tract, you see that the esophagus is short. You may remember from the respiratory uh, system uh, discussion that uh, the amphibians, they're using their throat muscles to draw air in, whereas the amniotes, the reptiles, birds, and mammals, are using changing the volume of the rib cage. Since the amniotes no longer need to use their throat to draw in air, they could change it and it became much longer. So the esophagus and trachea in amniotes is much longer, but here this uh, amphibian, it still must be short because of the requirements of the throat uh, for respiration. So you can see the stomach, you can see there is uh, a small intestine and then a terminal portion, uh, the large uh, intestine uh, here. And then the remaining uh, videos uh, just show some more images. The stomach is J-shaped. It has a uh, rugae uh, in it, um, as uh, you can uh, see here. Uh, these rugae allow it to expand. I mean, a frog like a bullfrog is actually capable of eating very large prey, including ducklings and bats and small snakes. And so, um, uh, the rugae allowing the stomach uh, to expand, uh, that is clearly an uh, advantage. Uh, so you can see uh, that uh, in frogs, there is a liver, which is quite uh, large, uh, a small intestine, the large intestine, notice the mesentery 
and the mesocolon attach, attaching to the intestines. Here you can see that the liver has multiple lobes and the stomach is J-shaped. Once again, these are typical aspects of the um, digestive uh, system. And uh, the liver produces um, a bile, which can be uh, concentrated in the gallbladder, once again, as is typical. The pancreas is present. It hugs the small intestine. Um, it's a narrow structure. You have to look hard for it, uh, but nevertheless, a thin uh, structure hu uh, hugging the uh, intestine, uh, similar to what we had seen in uh, the, uh, the shark. So uh, these are the uh, regions of the frog a digestive system, similar to what uh, we had seen in the shark. And uh, if you were to look at uh, the blood vessels, uh, once again, we see that arterial uh, blood uh, passes uh, through unpaired arteries. So here's the dorsal aorta. Um, just a quick recap. Um, in uh, frogs, both of the systemic arches are kept, whereas in humans, the only embryonic systemic arch is the third one. So there's only one dorsal aorta, but here there's a pair of systemic arches, which then fuse to make this uh, dorsal aorta. Once again, it is unpaired arteries, which reach the digestive tract. Here we see a celiacomesenteric uh, artery, uh, similar to the celiac uh, trunk, uh, which is in uh, humans. And from this, um, uh, from this, uh, we then have uh, branches, uh, which will then go uh, to uh, the stomach, uh, the uh, spleen, and other uh, organs. So here you can see the gastric um, uh, artery here, the mesenteric going to the intestines, the splenic artery going to the spleen, etc. So once again, we have a trunk like the celiac trunk in humans that then splits to make a gastric artery just as in humans. Um, here the mesenteric artery going to the intestines is also coming off uh, this, um, uh, this trunk. Uh, there's a splenic artery going to the spleen here as uh, well. Okay. Uh, now once again, the um, venous blood, which will come out of the digestive tract, uh, does not uh, go to uh, the inferior vena cava and back to the heart. Instead, it goes through that hepatic portal system. And so this is just standard in the vertebrates that these veins, all right, which are now going to drain the uh, digestive tract then empty into a hepatic portal vein, uh, which then uh, ultimately form um, uh, capillaries in the liver. So here you see the mesenteric veins uh, from the intestines forming that hepatic portal vein. The gastric veins from the stomach will not deliver their blood to the inferior vena cava, but rather that um, hepatic portal vein so that uh, the blood uh, will go to the liver first for processing in the uh, liver uh, before other systems of the body uh, uh, get it. Um, uh, and so uh, here, uh, uh, the uh, mesenteric uh, vein did not take up uh, the blue dye, uh, as we saw earlier, uh, uh, simply because uh, it has capillaries on either side. So that was the um, digestive system in frogs. If we were to look at salamanders, it would be sim uh, similar enough. We have a mouth. We have a very short esophagus. Once again, the esophagus cannot be long if amphibians rely on their throats for breathing. Uh, the esophagus empties into the uh, stomach, uh, which has um, uh, which is J-shaped. Uh, it is interesting that in lungfish and in salamanders, the lungs empty into the esophagus, as, as you can see uh, there. There is a, uh, a sphincter um, between the esophagus and the stomach, as we see in uh, humans, the esophageal sphincter. And notice once again, in this triple injected salamander, the yellow dye indicating that the blood coming out of the digestive tract does not join the inferior vena cava, but will rather go to the liver. Uh, so salamanders have a liver, they have a gallbladder, as you just saw in the previous uh, image. Um, here, uh, the um, uh, uh, inferior vena cava is not where the um, blood is going. So this is 
uh, staining blue and the venous blood from the digestive tract does not go into the post cava or inferior vena uh, cava. Instead, it will go uh, into the hepatic portal vein. So the hepatic portal vein right here in yellow uh, receives the uh, blood from the digestive tract. This goes into the liver where there are capillaries. And then from the liver, there is a hepatic vein, which will then go into the, um, ad, 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 in the inferior vena cava. So here you can see once again, the uh, uh, intestines, the mesenteric veins fusing um, before going into the uh, hepatic uh, portal vein, which goes into uh, the uh, liver. Uh, once again, here's intestinal veins uh, helping to form the hepatic portal vein uh, going uh, to uh, the liver. Uh, and so here is uh, the liver and the blood going through the hepatic vein, forming a hepatic sinus before going back to the um, uh, uh, through the heart. And so uh, these uh, are fairly uh, standard. Um, birds had to make a couple of modifications. Uh, one is because of flight, uh, they couldn't have a digestive system which weighs too much. So very few birds have appreciable intestine, which they would need to say digest leafy plant material. So if you think of how many um, birds eat, say, you know, grass and leaves, there aren't many. Uh, some would include geese, but they tend to be rather large and so large that it, it's hard for them to fly. Um, and then also as some of the flightless birds. Um, birds no longer have teeth. And so uh, those uh, birds were swallowing their uh, prey whole um, because it was the fossil lineages of birds which lost their teeth. Um, so for millions of years, birds had teeth, um, but then uh, uh, the uh, teeth were lost uh, so that uh, this would affect the, um, the center of gravity. And so it is now the gizzard that does grinding of the food, not the teeth. And the gizzard is close to the center of gravity. Um, birds uh, can have long tongues, uh, but obviously some lineages of birds, this is uh, exaggerated. So in both hummingbirds and in um, uh, in woodpeckers, the tongue is so long that when it is not uh, protruding from the bill, it can actually wrap around the skull and end at the eye. So the tongue is so long, once again, that it, it wraps around the skull and ends at the eye. And that way it can extend uh, for a significant distance out of uh, the tip of the bill. Uh, there is in uh, many birds an expansion of the esophagus known as a crop. And this would allow, say, a, uh, a dove, like if it flew to the ground, it could eat a lot of seeds that then get held in the crop and it could fly back up to uh, the safety of a uh, tree. Uh, there are some birds which can produce secretions in their crop known as crop milk that they use to uh, nourish uh, their uh, young. So once again, the crop is uh, a region of uh, the uh, esophagus. Um, the gizzard is a region of the stomach, and so the stomach can be split into a proventriculus and then a muscular region known as a gizzard for grinding. This way, grinding is done near the center of gravity rather than um, in uh, the mouth, uh, which would be farther from the center of gravity and make flight uh, more uh, difficult. Uh, a turkey's um, uh, a turkey's uh, gizzard can actually uh, uh, crush a walnut, obviously very hard, but you know, this is very muscular. Um, here you can see something from a, a fossil animal known as a gastrolith or a gizzard stone. There are some birds, especially birds which do not need to fly, which actually ingest stones so that in their gizzard, they actually have stones known as gastroliths. And as these churn, this uh, helps them uh, digest food. And here you can see gastroliths in a, a dinosaur. There are a number of, of animals which do eat stones um, so that they're retained in the digestive system uh, for uh, help here. And so removing the, uh, the teeth helped to uh, keep, and, and so that the gizzard being the place where food is ground, this helped make the uh, center of gravity adaptive uh, for uh, uh, flight.
So uh, uh, birds have livers and a gallbladder, and the liver is divided into lobes, there's a gallbladder. And so, uh, you know, in many ways, just then the other standard parts of the um, digestive uh, tract are uh, expected. Um, and then clearly there are so many different kinds of uh, birds that you can have uh, distinctions between them. Uh, once again, some of the ones which don't need to fly like this rhea can then have uh, structures uh, unlike what we see in others. So for example, if you look at uh, these uh, birds, uh, they can have more intestines, which allow them uh, to uh, rely more on leafy plant material, but then they can also have um, additional compartments leaving uh, their uh, large intestine, which can be especially long in uh, the rhea, as, uh, as you can see. Uh, once you start looking at mammals, uh, then uh, really uh, that uh, the digestive systems uh, are uh, essentially uh, comparable as you can um, uh, as you can see as you know we compare um, you know say the uh, so this would be the monkey you can see the esophagus is um, uh, is underneath the trachea here you can see the j-shaped stomach of an opossum with a lesser omentum on uh, one side, there are the rugae in the opossum's uh, stomach, uh, et cetera. Um, uh, many of the, um, uh, the herbivorous uh, mammals will have a cecum. This is a blind pouch from the large intestine. So when the ileum, the small intestine, empties into the large intestine, most of the material will go into the ascending colon. But there can also be a cecum um, especially uh, in animals which rely more on plant material. Uh, this is in uh, the uh, monkey, uh, but the cecum can be quite uh, large in some of the, uh, the hoofed animals. Humans and other apes have reduced theirs uh, so that uh, the appendix is kind of a remnant of you know, the, the portion of the cecum which is no longer uh, used. All right, so um, I have uh, individual uh, uh, you know, videos and images of many of these uh, mammals, um, but they are largely, you know, the same. So rather than, you know, repeat, you know, that the liver has lobes and that the, you know, hepatic duct and cystic duct from the gallbladder fuse to make the common bile duct, you know, these are, are fairly common um, uh, things. Let me just mention a few uh, exceptions. Uh, when we looked at the hoofed animals, as the artiodactyls evolved, they formed a number of lineages. Um, the, uh, uh, the pigs and uh, hippos, they increased the number of chambers in their uh, stomach to be three. And then when we go to the ruminants, uh, these then have a four chambered uh, stomach. They also have more skeletal muscle along their esophagus, which gives them voluntary control. So what they can do is chew their food, swallow it into their stomach, and then later regurgitate it back into their mouth. Once again, the esophagus has voluntary uh, muscle. And then they can chew it a second time. This is known as chewing the cud and then uh, swallow it uh, again. Uh, they, uh, this is found in animals which tend to eat fairly low nutrient uh, foods like grass. Um, but if they're going to process it that efficiently that they can actually get sufficient nutrition from uh, grass uh, because uh, of, uh, of this. So that's, you know, an interesting aspect of these uh, ruminants, uh, which are ruminating as, um, you know, we're chewing the cud. The stomach has separate uh, chambers, including uh, one uh, which will house um, symbiotic fungi, which help them digest uh, uh, grass uh, and cellulose. So that's uh, helpful. So you can see the very large um, you know, stomachs, which we'll see here. So here, you know, is the esophagus leading into the big stomach. You can see how uh, large uh, this, uh, uh, this is. So here you can see in the pig, uh, um, the pig being an artiodactyl, but not a ruminant, um, uh, doesn't have four chambers, but rather three. Uh, here you can see the large stomach in the sheep, uh, the goat, once again, the separate chambers then increase the size of uh, of this uh, structure. Uh, here you can see the large um, stomach on the cow. Uh, once again, uh, the large intestine will end uh, with a more prominent cecum, 
That's what you see here, this blind uh, pouch, uh, which will then hold populations of uh, the microbes, which are so important for digestion. So here you can see a small intestine, a large intestine, but here's that blind pouch known as the uh, cecum. Right? And so here you can see uh, uh, in uh, diverse uh, artiodactyls, um, here the large intestine emptying into the, uh, the small intestine emptying into the large intestine, and then there uh, being the uh, cecum. Uh, once again, we see homology in the blood vessels. So it is unpaired arteries, uh, which bring blood to the organs of the digestive system. So for example, in uh, cats, uh, there would be a celiac trunk, which would then split uh, to make the hepatic artery going to the liver, uh, the gastric artery going to the stomach, and the splenic artery going to the spleen. So just as in humans, this celiac trunk trifurcates. And then there are uh, superior and inferior mesenteric arteries uh, bringing oxygenated blood to the intestines. Deoxygenated blood empties into the hepatic portal vein, which goes into the uh, liver. And so, um, here you can see that if this is the dorsal aorta in the cat, the superior mesenteric artery is unpaired. There isn't a left and right version. The celiac trunk is unpaired. There isn't a left and right version. And from here, you can see there's a hepatic artery, a gastric artery, and then the, uh, uh, the splenic uh, artery. And, and so uh, once again, we see you know, uh, homology in uh, the uh, blood vessels, which uh, take oxygenated blood to the GI tract. And the same is true of the hepatic portal vein, which then receives the deoxygenated uh, blood from the intestines, the stomach, et cetera, and then delivers it to the, uh, uh, the liver. So here you can see the arteries servicing the um, uh, digestive tract. And then we can see, um, there's the the arteries once again. And then here you can see the hepatic portal vein. This cat is not triple injected. So while the arteries are red and the veins are blue, the hepatic portal vein will appear a dull brown from the coagulated blood inside. It's a portal vein with capillaries on either side, which is why the blue latex uh, was not able uh, then uh, to make its way um, uh, to make its uh, way into uh, this uh, uh, this uh, vessel. Um, and so uh, I have a little bit more on uh, uh, ruminants, uh, and I've been focusing on the homology of these organs at the macroscopic uh, level, um, but we would also see homology in the microscopic level. So um, the intestine is just intestine, um, but uh, under the microscope, we would split it into separate regions, a duodenum, uh, a jejunum and an ileum based on uh, differences uh, which we uh, see here. And uh, you can see um, and the similarity in uh, the uh, cross sections of the intestine here, not only the same layers of the uh, GI tract, uh, but then also these uh, prominent uh, villi which are increasing uh, the uh, surface area. So just as the, the surface area in uh, the human GI tract uh, is um, uh, increased by, you know, the rising and falling of, you know, these uh, villi. Uh, we see the same in, uh, in frogs. Um, the stomach lining of frogs has gastric pits with multiple cell types, just as we would see in humans. There are gastric pits where some of the cells are secreting acid, some of them are secreting the enzyme pepsin, some, some of them secrete a protective uh, mucus, and we can see the same uh, thing uh, in, the, um, uh, in uh, the frog uh, uh, stomach. Uh, as, as well, these different cell types. So once again, uh, the human uh, digestive tract is not uh, uh, unique uh, in that uh, we have simply modified the uh, structures which uh, are typical uh, in, ancestral, um, in ancestral mammals. So I had a previous video where I uh, focused on the layers of the GI tract in vertebrates and the specializations of the mouth and teeth. Uh, this one looked at the diversity of vertebrate uh, digestive systems in other um, 
uh, in the other parts of the GI tract and the accessory structures. And I also have an additional uh, video, which is focusing on the anatomy of the human uh, digestive uh, tract.